There we go. Okay. So, hey guys. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hi, Selena. <laughs> Jerry, can you smile, please? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm smiling because of my my beard. It was hidden. The smile was hidden. <laughs> it was buried. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, um, good to see you. Uh, as you are well aware, um, Volume 17 is out. It's in 3D tangible form now. And um, due to the whole COVID-19 thing, we have been forced to do this, which is actually turning out to be quite enjoyable because we get to hang out with people that we don't normally see. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring the three of you together to talk about the story that is in, in the newest issue. Uh, we called it Well Suited, and I think it's pretty fun. We're going to show some pictures throughout the, um, the interview. But I basically kind of want to say as little as possible and let you guys talk because you're the experts. But I wanted to get a little bit of a background of uh, how Shate and Jerry got together to talk about doing a show, what the idea was behind it, and then um, the idea for the story and how the interview went down and a little bit of background on all of you because you guys all do really interesting and cool and creative and artistic important things. So um, I think that Probably the way to do this, and I'm going to cut this out because we don't need this part, but we're obviously going to try and not talk over each other. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think we're all pretty practiced at this point, so you'll, you'll know. And then try to maybe mute yourself if you're not talking so that we don't have any weird feedback. Sometimes that kind of happens. But anyway, um, Shate, do you want to go first and talk about the background on all this? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Tell me when you're going to start recording again. I'm recording, sister. <laughs> so um, this show came about because Heather Hall, who is, has been a really great friend to, to me personally and, and Big Car, um, she, she was talking about Jerry Lee, and, and she was like, you should have some of his work in a show. And then I was like, yeah, Jerry is one of the most undervalued artists in town. Um, I was really nervous about it too because, and, and initially we talked about just one piece as part of a show that was specifically about country Western music. But I was like, well, Jerry really needs a whole show. Um, just thinking about what he means to the city and, and really to fashion in general and how he's created a bridge um, through fashion. But I'm also not an expert on textiles. And so it was really important to me to be able to bring in Petra um, Slinkard to work with us on this project with Jerry um, to make sure that, first of all, we're caring for the, the, the clothing right and then just be able to put it in context in a way that I can't um, because I'm not an expert. So a little bit of background. Um, so Jerry, you mm -hmm. make suits, amazing suits for all kinds of now famous people mm -hmm. and um, we're super proud and excited to have you be part of the indie creative community. And um, I know that you've shared the story a few times, but maybe a little bit of a background uh, of what it is that you do exactly. Because we're talking about clothes and some people might not be aware of what you do. Um, we want them to buy this issue and read more about you, but just give them a little bit of a taste. Taste of Jerry. <laughs> um, so you want my, st my story from the beginning from, or, or the abbreviated version of it. Well, how long would the beginning take? Well, okay, so obviously, our, um, as I guess I've told everyone 
my story, but if I'm telling it to someone who's never heard it before. Um, so I'm an art school dropout. Um, I went to Heron for a year, <clears throat> went to IU for half a year, and kind of saw people around me who um, were working in coffee shops and were working in fields that were not art related, who had spent all this time and money going to art school and kind of seen their dreams, you know, dashed more or less. Um, you know, just they really wanted this thing and they spent all this time and money and had this like idea of like this artist that they wanted to be and this like cool bohemian career that they wanted or lifestyle. And they were poor and, you know, not, or, or if they weren't poor, they were working in like finance or, you know, something completely unrelated to, to art. And I didn't want to put money and time into something that I didn't think had a future. I wanted to be an artist, but you know, I've always said like, I'd rather be um, destitute and living under a bridge and able to make art um, than like work some nine to five corporate job. Uh, so anyways, I dropped out of art school, ended up in coffee shops, making, you know, making art. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in art. Um, I got really good at drawing. I got really good at painting. Um, I dabbled in printmaking, but I really struggled to find my voice in art. Uh, so sometime in like the late nineties, I picked up, um, I was at a craft store and I saw a book about embroidery and I was like, Oh, that sounds interesting. So I bought a book about embroidery, uh, hand embroidery. Um, you know, bought uh, an embroidery hoop, needles, thread, all that stuff. So I taught myself to embroider. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. Like, this is really interesting, something I didn't know how to do. Um, it's like painting, but with thread. Uh, so I got really good at, at hand embroidery. And then at some point, I kind of felt like, what am I going to do with, what am I going to do with embroidery? What am I going to do with this? And then um, one day a customer came to the coffee shop that I worked at and he said, you know, um, I, he always saw me like hand embroidering um, while I was working and, you know, put it aside when the customer would come up. And I was listening to like indie rock and you know, like alternative music, whatever. And so he said, you know, I know you like embroidery and you like, you know, interesting music or whatever and i have this book that i want you to borrow about the history of western life and you know my dad collected um albums he had this huge record collection and he had uh all the old stuff like um porter wagner and um, you know webb pierce and they were all on the covers wearing their nudie suits their fancy western suits and my dad would always take my the family to nashville to opryland and we'd always watch Hee Haw at my grandma's house. So I had all these memories kind of like in the back of my mind of, of being around this culture and being and seeing this stuff. Um, and so there's like this nostalgia factor that kind of came to me. Um, and, I, and I thought like, you know, it'd be cool to make a Western shirt um, and use my embroidery skills and, you know, incorporate that. And uh, so I went to Joanne's, bought fabric, bought pearl snap, bought all the piping and everything. Uh, borrowed my roommate's sewing machine, and this, this, as I always say, I made the world's ugliest Western shirt. But again, there was something about the process of sewing that really appealed to me. Um, and again, you know, being in a medium, working in a medium that I wasn't comfortable with, wasn't familiar with. I felt like there was a lot of, you know, I like a challenge and I thought it would be like a good opportunity to um, build a new skill and, uh, you know, and just like, I just like a challenge. So um, I, bought, I started buying books about sewing. I went to Half Price Books. Um, order, I got a subscription to Threads Magazine. Um, at that time, there wasn't, you know, YouTube was around, but there wasn't really a lot of, um, there wasn't like that kind of um, community where you could like go on and 
go online and figure out how to do something. So I was really teaching myself to sew from uh, books and magazines. Um, and it was a lot more challenging than I imagined somebody who was trying to teach themselves to sew uh, today, you know, where they could just go on YouTube and like download a tutorial. And I still do that sometimes, you know, and I, I feel like that's one thing that's cool about sewing is there's so much there. Um, there's so much to learn. There's so much um, knowledge to gather. Um, you know, you're 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 always learning. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's the same way for painters or sculptors, or whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, so I guess we're hang on. Let me break in. And also, yeah. can I just say, you guys feel free to ask questions as well. I want this to be like a four-way conversation um, to make it more. I feel like the questions that I would ask might not be as um, insightful as maybe the questions you guys could ask. But what is it about the sewing machine? Like, can you put your finger on it? Like, what? why do you like that as the medium? I guess I'm, I'm kind of an analog person. Like, I like... Um, I like, uh, you know, machines. I like, you know, I collect antique typewriters. I've been collecting antique typewriters since the mid nineties. Um, I guess I like the, um, I guess I like those machines, you know, the things that have, that are very, um, I don't know what the word for it is. Uh, I just, I just, all the time. what's that? Old and break down all the time. Yeah, <laughs> no, and that's that's part of the that's part of the skill in sewing is that you know you kind of have to be your own um, technician. You know, you you can't just be calling Ed from Indianapolis Sewing Machine every um, you know every time your machine breaks down, or else you'd go broke. Like you have to figure out how that machine works, and when when you have to be able to troubleshoot. Um, and figure out like the tension and all that stuff. So I think part of it's just like the, you know, like if you were a car person and you know you were really into cars and you have a bunch of old cars, your cars are going to break down. But part of the fun is that you know you're the person who knows how to fix it and get and make it run and you know look cool driving around a little bit. Um, but it's that same it's that same idea of it's this old thing that you know and like the history. I I, I like the old antique and vintage sewing machines and there's something cool about like the history of knowing that you know back in the 30s or 40s someone was making who knows what dresses or seats whatever sounds like uh, you're a history buff yeah i mean i love history yeah and i mean that's one thing about like with the machines um and especially the chain stitch embroider machines i i almost wrote a book and i still would like to at some point about the history of chain stitch embroidery in America because I find it really fascinating. And unfortunately, a lot of the old chain stitchers from, um, you know, that were active in the middle part of the 20th century are dying or passed away. But when I started, a lot of those people were still alive and a lot of those people um, I would find through, sell, you know, they were selling their machine on eBay, or Craigslist or whatever, and I'd write and say like, you know, oh, like who, who in your family used it? Did you use this? Did your mom use it? Whatever. Uh, and so I got a lot of like in really interesting information about the machines themselves from some of the older people that were using them. Um, like the best example, there was a guy in California that was selling um, a Cornelli, which is an old uh, chain stitch embroidery machine. Uh, and it was actually the first that was mass manufactured and it was manufactured in um, France. Uh, and so um, Singer at some point bought the patents and the copyrights and all that and started producing their own version here. But a lot of the, a lot of the purists, I guess, back in the day really liked the Cornelli. Um, uh, Gary, so I, what? I, I have a question. So did you do the Naptown Roller Girls' uniforms? The, so that was so so one thing I that was when I first learned about you and your work and and something I felt um was really you know like finally Indianapolis had a roller derby team 
you know, it was uh, an important part, I felt, of, of shaping the popular culture of our city at that time. And, and you were largely responsible for that look. Can you talk a bit about those uniforms of the, that you made for the Naptown Roller Girls? And Yeah, so my, so my ex-wife, um, when, before we were, yeah, before we were married, were we married? No, it was before we were married. Um, she had joined the Naptown Roller Girls, uh, and we were living together. And um, she knew Michelle Pemberton, like she was friends with, we became friends with Michelle Pemberton, who was kind of one of the early members. And um, and Jamie, it was, oh, it was my ex wife, Jamie. Um, she said, you know, hey, Jerry can sew and he makes these Western shirts. Like, why don't you have him make the uniform shirts? Uh, and they'd be Western style. And there was um, uh, Sherry Fouts, um, or I don't know what her last name is now, but um, Sherry was really into like old country, and her name, her roller derby name was Toretta Lynn. Um, so it kind of like worked with like the whole Midwestern and kind of like the tornado sirens and this like country bumpkin kind of idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I started making all their roller derby shirts and some of them wanted rhinestones. Um, some of them, but they, all, all of them were Western. So they all have like the arrow pockets and the uh, pearls mask and everything. Um, and so I just kind of had like a lot of creative freedom with, uh, you know, making shirts that kind of um, were inspired by their name. Like their Strawberry Jam, she was one of the founding members, so hers had strawberries on it with flying stones, and uh, I'm trying to remember some of the others. Michelle Pemberton was Red Rocket. I don't remember what was on her. Oh, yeah, hers had stars um, and rhinestones and you know, all that stuff. Um, so it was a lot of fun, and, and you know, and it was... Um, like it was kind of an interesting phenomenon. Like I don't think anyone expected the Naptown Roller Girls to get as big as they did in you know like in early 2000s, mid 2000s, whatever. I think 2006 or so um, was when they were like really active or had their biggest following. But you know, I remember there was some bout where because uh, we were all essentially volunteers, so I was making these uniform shirts for. Um, cost of material uh so i wasn't making any money on them it was just like us really losing money on them. but it was fun and i got to see my i got to see people appreciate my work and um and talk about it and kind of be this like sort of weird celebrity in the roller, roller derby community um which was kind of fun but uh i remember there was one bout where um you know they had set up the bleachers and everything and you know they expected maybe like 2,000 people and I think the I think like 6,000 people showed up and I mean it was like completely packed and we were all crying we were like holy shit you know so I get really emotional sometimes I don't know talking about this stuff we need to cut um, from the beer is what we need to do <laughs> <laughs> was for you. Um, no no it's like I said in the in my little um, storytellers thing it's like you know our com our connection with fashion is so personal to us and it's hard to talk about you know it's hard to talk about these things that you have such a strong passion for without getting emotional and getting choked up about because it is really important to me and like I don't know sorry <laughs> I don't know that I would be alive if I didn't have this in my life. It's that important to me. I think that so. that's one of the interesting things about like your connection to the machines also, you know, I mean, you are, and we talked about this in your interview, you know, you are a storyteller and, you know, like cloth is your medium and, you know, these machines are your tools, but it, I don't think you'd be telling the same stories with the same kind of personal connection if you, if you weren't using the authentic tools that you seek out, that you then study, that you want to write a book about, you know, you wouldn't have this trajectory of, you know, putting um, symbols that represent individuals on cloth, you know, if you hadn't had that connection to the roller derby, 
you know, team and that like, this is this evolution, you know, so it's totally understandable that that's a, you know, a heartfelt journey, you know, that comes through in the pieces that you make because they are, you know, these one of a kind individualistic, you know, works of art. And I think that that's, I mean, it's, yeah, you should, <laughs> you know, like it, it yeah, makes I know. Sense. Yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to talk about the thing you have a passion for without like, and I think and I think you know anyone who has like a real passion for something, um, and has like pride in what they do, I guess. Um, it it's it's it becomes you. You know, like every aspect of my life has kind of become what I do. Um, I mean, there's not you know there's not a moment where I'm not connected to like I don't have I don't have days off I don't have breaks it's like it's always you know like I'm always checking emails and I'm always updating social media and you know all these things like I'm always like on 24 24/7 you know making what I do you know making clothing making sewing um hey, so Chuck, I think it's on. like Let yeah me let me ask Petra a question because I, I, I want her expert commentary. Um, you, you haven't, oh, don't make that face. You no, I know. But... <laughs> so, so I don't even know your title, which is really embarrassing because I'm supposed to be the MC. Um, but you obviously are, you work with fashion all the time and you kind of have a perspective of it through the ages. And so, I'm curious where Western wear fits in and like what its meaning is to today's pop culture. Cause I feel like it was sort of on the way out and now it's back in. And like, do you have any thoughts on where that came from or um, where this genre fits in, I guess? I don't know if that's a good question or not. But. Uh, no, I, I think it's a great question, but I actually think Jerry's the best person to answer it. Um, and so, I can certainly respond to that, but I mean, Jerry definitely knows the history of Western wear um, and has done that research. Um, and so I'm, I'll, I'll let you answer that and then I can kind of respond to that. Well, yeah, I mean, this is something that, you know, we talked about, you and I, Petra, on the phone one, kind of about how I think, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, kind of about how um, I feel like western wear like with rhinestones kind of in the heyday of western wear like 50s through 70s when a lot of these musicians were touring um clubs and honky tonks and you know on their tour bus all over the country playing these little places where people didn't really leave their towns they were kind of bringing this um glamour and glitz to these people who had only heard these musicians on the radio and who probably didn't tra you know, weren't real well traveled, weren't maybe well educated. Um, but you know, they were getting this experience and they were getting kind of this like um this bling and this flash, uh, and kind of like this like we're we're up here, these musicians were up here giving you this experience more than just like playing music. Um and I think now uh, that people are more well-traveled and can go places and do their town, I think in a lot of ways, um, kind of the hip hop culture, um, <clears throat> I think there's that aspect of hip hop culture that's like flashy, we drive you know, expensive cars, we have expensive jewelry, <laughs> we have all this like, Kind of like money and where and in a way they're kind of doing the same thing now to like the culture that they come from as these country musicians were doing like hey we're up here we're living this like awesome lifestyle and people are living vicariously through that <clears throat> and i think um it's kind of like a natural i think it was sort of a natural evolution of some somewhere sometime i don't know who um i mean i have my ideas about it um without taking too much credit away from me but um about who kind of introduced hip-hop culture to um western wear 
And I will say, I think Kathy Hahn, who is the stylist for Post Malone, really had a lot to do with that. Um, because she had kind of an idea, again, not to too much credit, but, you know, I made the book. But I think her putting that stuff on Post Malone initially and people seeing it and being like, Oh, wow, this is, and here's the funny thing. I don't think a lot of young audiences, a lot of the young audience and the fans of Post Malone would ever know where that style comes from. I don't think they have no clue. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they see it and are like, wow, that's really wild. It's got embroidery, it's got rhinestones, it's like decadent, it's flashy. Um, and I think uh, it just kind of, you know, spread and, throughout hip hop culture and kind of like through culture in general of people trying to emulate that look and people, you know, rediscovering it in more or less. Um, and to that point, I think that like, that's part of, you know, to Pauline's question about like the fashion history, I think that that's what it, what, what Western wear is doing to, to at this point that like where Jerry's at, you know, I mean, you see those parallels throughout fashion history time and time again, where you know there's a, a point of an extremism, right? Where you've got a, a, a garment that is for all intents and purposes, utilitarian. And then it's like, well, how can I make this more, you know, how do I, how do I rethink its purpose beyond, you know, its primary function. And, um, and I think that that's where that history of like glitz and glam and kind of pushing the limits, you know, really comes into play. And you see that, you know, from everything from haute couture and the very splashy, expensive, you know, runway shows to, you know, kids embellishing like their jeans or their sweatshirts or, you know, whatever, like everybody's trying to communicate something, you know, in, um, you know, sort of an adaption of sorts, you know? And so I think, you know, for when Chate, you know, and Jerry were thinking about this exhibition, you know, when we got together as a, as a trio, you know, that was certainly, you know, some of the things that we talked about is that like, that this, you know, Jerry's work is, it really kind of hits on these multiple levels, you know, it isn't, just about clothing and it isn't just about celebrity culture, you know, but it has all of these, you know, multifaceted um, entry points for people. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so the show, it has been postponed. Mm -hmm. um, Chate, uh, Jerry, sorry to hear that. Um, but what's the vision? What, when people, when it finally opens and tell us when it will, what what can people expect to see or is that still something that you're working on i think that's something we're still working on well right? we're working on we're, we're on it right now <laughs> we are borrowing we're working on borrowing some um suits that jerry made in the past um you know in terms of of the exhibit we do you know we're, we're gonna move it to the fall uh, of 2020, I hope, as long as there's not some, gosh, you know, at this point. But anyway, goal is fall of, of 2020. I I have been thinking about how to, I, I do expect it to be a very well-attended exhibit. Um, so it might be ticketed where people come at certain intervals um, so that we can have people safely in the space with the new dis 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 social distancing requirements. Um, so those are just some things that we're thinking about right now. Um, you know, of course, very thankful and grateful to you for documenting, um, Polina, for documenting some of the suits that, that Jerry has been um, producing. He, we, we were able to document the um the um orville peck suit do you want to talk about any of that pedro or, or jerry i i don't want to go on and on. i can i can really prattle off on these things so i think jerry should talk about the suit um which one were you which one were you talking about the um the orville peck yeah the yeah so suit, but, um, the suit with the nudity <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the suit with the nudity. Uh, so that was kind of um, an interesting project. 
Um, there's a tattoo artist named uh, Mars Hobrecker from New York City who's a trans um, tattoo artist. And he does a lot of um, kind of like homoerotic um, cowboy um, tattoos. And uh, my business partner, uh, Joe David Walters, who lives in London, uh, reached out to him sometime last year and said, you know, we really love your work. Uh, Orville really likes your work. Um, would you be interested in doing like some kind of collaboration? So we sent him a, um, like a draw, like a sketch of a suit outline. And then he put his, um, some of his designs on it and um, sent it back. And then I enlarged it and embroidered it, and covered it with rhinestones. Uh, so that was my first time ever doing that kind of collaboration where I had someone else. I always design it. I always design the embroidery. So this was the first time having someone else um, do that. And it was kind of not something I was initially really excited about, but um, because I feel like it's taking a little bit of control out of my hands. But then when I see the finished product, it's kind of like giving that person, not that person needs exposure, not that Mars needs exposure, he has like you know, 60,000 Instagram followers. Um, but, you know, it is kind of neat to have this um, uh, piece out there that um, has so many different hands in it, you know. Um, but I still created it. Um, and it got on the cover of a magazine. Oh, I can't remember what the magazine was. It's like the largest um, gay uh, LGBTQ magazine in uh, the UK. Um, was it a gay letter? What? Gay letter? No, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, I would look on my phone. But we'll find it. We'll look yeah. it. That's awesome. That's and really he, he posed with Diplo. Your, oh, your yeah. Diplo suit. What are, you, uh, what are you working on right now? Other than masks. Other than masks? Other than masks. What's next? Who are, who are like... Well, yeah. I was some suits for um, Orville Peck's band, and they were going to wear them um, at LA Pride. But I don't know that LA Pride's going to happen mm -hmm. because I just read that um, their social distancing, that was going to be like early June, and their social distancing or stay at home order has been extended through at least um, early to mid June. And when it does, when they do reopen, um, I think I read that they're not going to, going to allow um, concerts or sporting events until 2021. So I'm just working on, I have a bunch of wedding clients that I'm working on stuff for. Um, there's a doctor uh, who works with ALS, children who are ALS patients. Uh, I'm working on, a, I'm going to be working on a suit for him once I'm able to get back to my studio. Oh, um, the woman from American Pickers, actually, uh, Danielle, I don't know if you've watched that show. She ordered a face mask and um, is interested in having a suit made. Nice. So Very cool. Uh, and I'm a big fan of that show. Petra, I'm curious. I mean, you lived here in Indy. So you're, you're familiar with our culture here. And now you're on the East Coast. What, do you have any thoughts? Do you, do the artists where you are face similar issues in terms of how they are appreciated and compensated for their art? Definitely. Um, well, I was just going to say, um, you know, Jerry Lee, don't ever, don't ever not charge what you think you should just because when we were talking about the number of hours, you know, I feel like if someone ever questions you on your price, <laughs> just return like a piece of paper that says, you know, these are the number of hours. Like, you know, I mean, I think that there's, there's an economics to a product that we are very um, apt to break down when it's sold in a store and there are multiple hands, you know, applied to it in that supply chain. Um, and for whatever reason, we tend to, you know, accept that. But certainly, you know, there's a, 
organization in Salem. Um, I live in Salem, Massachusetts, and there's an organization called the Creative Collective, and it was formed for that very reason, you know, to provide local artists with an opportunity to band together and, you know, very similar in the, in the sense that Pattern came together. Like it's a, an organization um, that provides support, um, resources, you know, uh, references, um, advice, you know. Um, but I, I definitely think that there is, in general, um, a lack of awareness on behalf of patrons who don't support artists um, in the way that they should be supported. Um, because again, I think that there's this sort of like obsession with notoriety. And mm -hmm. so you have people who, you know, maybe led in a direction or maybe have an instinct um, to buy something that they think, you know, that, that resonates with them, right? Like emotionally or otherwise. Um, and then, you know, 20 years later, it might end up being worth something. But that value, you know, that you're attaching a price tag to doesn't equate the value of wearing it or living with it or experiencing it or getting to share it with other people, you know. So I, I think that there's a different um, way of, like, looking at art in your personal life, you know, that a lot of people haven't really necessarily been um, – and taught sounds so kind of like pejorative and I don't mean for it to be, but I, I think that like we as a culture value commodity. And so mm. we either lump our into something that is, you know, nice and it makes us feel good or it's like right. commodity, you know? Right. And, and I think that there's a, a healthy balance between the two where you, you know, and, and people need to better understand like, oh, there's a process involved here. There's a history here. There's a, you know, a, um, a, a, a lineage of learning, you know, that went into this. Like, Jerry didn't just pick up embroidery one day and then all of a sudden the next day start, you know, designing for celebrities. Like, there was a 20-year, you know, growth period where he invested, you know, his time, his energy, his family's time, energy, like, blood, sweat, and tears. And, you know, that is what I think people need to understand, you know, and not that like, oh, well, here's the shiny object that I can like wave around and show people like, oh, I'm a part of this now. Um, mm -hmm. But I do, I think it's an, I think it's an international thing, you know, I mean, we're inundated with um, stuff, you know, so it's hard, I think, to sometimes understand like where are our, you know, where things come from. And, and to that point, you know, I think that the market, like the off market, you know, um, like aggregators like Etsy and whatnot, um, I think have done, you know, they flooded the market for sure. But I also think that, that you know, it has done a justice to people's kind of adjusting their um, understanding of like what a homemade good is or what a handmade good is, you know, and there's a deeper appreciation to the story and the lineage, you know, behind it. So it's, you know, we got a long way to go, but I think there's a foundation there. <laughs> but no, it's not just an Indiana thing. <laughs> okay. I was wondering, um, I mean, I lived in Chicago, but that was a long time ago, and it was before I got into all of this, so I don't really have a way of, of gauging, but that's comforting, I guess? <laughs> I don't know. Well, we're all, what are the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the arts communities do work different, and art world works different in LA and New York and Chicago. I mean, those are the, you know where, where they, they can, they kind of set the market. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it would be nice if uh, we valued artists more here. I remember um, there was a, this guy, he was telling me how he had worked two weeks on, on a table, at, like a solid 80 hours on, on creating this table and his sister liked it. And his sister was like, well, how much for that table? And he told her uh, his price and she thought it like she wanted it for like $200, <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and that was here. That was a, 
that was a furniture maker here um, who was talking about just, you know, the market here, it's, it is different and um, we're building it. You know, that's part of the reason why it's important to have shows like Jerry's show is that we're trying to, you know, think, have people think about the value of an artist and their work. And, you know, especially with Jerry's works, it's valuable on so many different levels. It's, it's valuable um, because of the time he spends on it because of his notoriety and, and because of how he can take a symbol or a series of symbols that you feel represent you as an individual and, and create something that you wear um, that's yours that you own. Yeah. So um, that's a focus of, you know, and what I'm always looking for when it comes to, you know, our commissioned exhibits are different than our other shows. So we have commissioned exhibits at Big Heart and we have, we also provide a platform to, to most people who want to show their work. Mm -hmm. But the commissioned exhibits, you know, I always choose one Indianapolis based at least per year. And I consider that an investment and a way to, um, you know, give them a platform, give them, you know, and also point out like, look, it's possible for people here to be working at that level that Jerry is making suits for Lil Nas X, Post Malone. Um, these people who are superstars live here and, and we need to know who they are and we need to value them and pay them if we, you know, have the money and, um, and our, and I think we do here, you know? Um, so what do you, the pandemic? Yeah, I right. still want, I still have, you know, even though we're in a pandemic and, and I know basic needs are important, the arts are still important uh, as well. And the show is still important and it's going to happen. <laughs> we lost Jerry, but that's all right. He's like, sorry. Um, what, with the show, what do you want people to take away from it? Well, I mean, first of all, I want, when, when people come to our space, I want them to have a sense of pride living here in Indiana, being from Indiana, you know. So I want to share work that make people think about things and feel a sense of pride, uh, you know, because there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of times Indiana and Indianapolis is the, you know, at times the butt of jokes um, or, you know, especially if you're working in, in certain circles where there's, you know, I, I work with people all over the world and there's been times, you know, that I'm embarrassed. Um, to say that I was from here um, because of maybe certain things that come up in the news that make us seem ignorant or, you know, it's drive over, like flyover country, you know, like Hillary Clinton even said. So I want to support people and artists who are making work like Jerry that I'm really, that, that make me excited to live here. Cause I do love living here and I, I'm, you know, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so this is kind of the piece that I, the little part I can do um, that I have some control over making this a city that I want to live in. And hopefully, you know, seeing Jerry's work and, and other artists that are at our space, um, seeing that work continues to make it somewhere that people, other people want to put down roots and stay here. And, you know, that's, that's the goal. Yeah, I hear you on that. Petra, are you ever going to come back? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe. I mean, you know, I love Indiana. Uh, but, you know, I also have to, like, pay bills. <laughs> so we'll see. But well, it's been fun, you know. I mean, I love, um, I loved my time in Indianapolis. And, um, you know, I, I also really enjoyed my time in Chicago and, you know, now I'm living in a new place and it's, um, 
it's different than the Midwest for sure. But on the one hand, I've been able to kind of take some of my Midwesternness with me, which is great, and apply that. Um, but uh, yeah, but it's but each experience has been totally different and like total, you know, exciting for very different reasons. Um, and you know, it's funny when I moved to Chicago and I first started getting settled there, and you know, I was working. Um, at the History Museum and talking to people about fashion and there were, you know, jaded people who were like, oh, there's no fashion in Chicago. And I'm like, okay, you know. Um, but then I would also get the flip side and people, you know, would tell me, you know, like, I'd say I, was, I had moved here from Indianapolis and they'd be like, oh my God, aren't you so glad you got out of there? And I'm like, have you ever been to Indianapolis? Like, <laughs> how, how do you even know? Um, you know, and now I live in Salem, Massachusetts, which you would not think is a hotbed of fashion activity. And yet, you know, the Boston, New England area has a really interesting, you know, scene that in, in many cases kind of replicates um, a feeling and a vibe that I saw in Indy where, you know, the scale is smaller as far as like who's doing what. But, you know, you have like Aaron Robertson who, you know, one project runway you've got you know individuals like tom solo who's doing shoes for lady gaga i mean like there is a community here of individuals who are choosing to keep and make boston their home or new england their home you know um there's a fashion week that's been going on for 25 years i mean so there's it's just one of those places that i think unfortunately like indianapolis gets lumped in and it's like oh well if you're not you know one of the coastal cities like that you know you you don't you don't resonate on the same scale and i you know i think all of you know this about me and i think that's something that we share like for me it's so much more interesting to think about you know who are we not hearing from who are we not seeing you know whose stories can we kind of pull out and you know lift up and try to figure out like okay this is this you know really amazingly talented person who's just doing their thing you know not worried about all of this other noise um and you know doing it well and like i think that that's the point that gets missed sometimes when it's like oh well you can live and work in new york and and no disrespect to new yorkers but like how are you you know how are di how are you differentiating yourself you know from what everyone else is doing you know and i think that that becomes increasingly more difficult like in you know the age of the internet and in all of these things so you know there's some really special people out there and i think geography really doesn't have a whole lot to do with it <laughs> so yeah. i would agree i would agree we've got some great people in indy um doing amazing things and that's part of the reason why this is still going nine years later, my God. <laughs> well, anyway, um, Jerry, thank you so much for um, hanging with us. Um, okay. We're super excited to check out your show in November. Um, looking forward on seeing the pieces come together and all the details fall into place. Hopefully Petra will make a, a pilgrimage down here to see it. Um, and if you guys don't mind, if you can just share your socials where people can find you and follow you and to learn more about your work, the show, who you are, um, that would be super helpful. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I'll go first. Um, so on Instagram, I'm P Slinks, S-L-I-N-K-S with a P in front of it. Um, and I work at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. And pretty much anything that I do associated with the museum, um, I'm using the hashtag PEM Fashion and Textiles or PEM Fashion and Design. Um, and if you're on the East Coast, come in and find me. Uh, it's a little bit of a over the river through the woods, but once you're here, it's a really fantastic community. Um, there's a lot of really interesting people living here. and. Uh, you know, we do have um, some interesting history too. And I just am so excited to work with all of you again and um, continually. So thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Jerry? Uh, my Instagram is Union, Union Western Clothing. Um, I have another Instagram where I post more like personal type of stuff. Uh, that people can follow if they're really interested. Um, it's more of like 
<clears throat> more personal projects. Um, and I always went to um, the Un Union Western clothing Instagram, but that one is Hoosier Built, H-O-O-S-I-E-R-B-U-I-L-T, for people who aren't familiar with the word Hoosier, um, very Indiana, or, or it's what we call ourselves for some weird reason that no one <laughs> um, But yeah, that's my, where I'm most active on social media. Okay, awesome. And you're currently making masks. Masks, masks, Custom masks. and made diamond yeah. encrusted wait not diamond crystal yeah swarovski uh uh rhinestone crystal rhinestone. But, yeah and what i know my stones people i know my stones i actually got contacted by the country music hall of fame uh yesterday and they want me to make two masks for what the um because they just want to kind of document uh what's happening and um right now and you know I'm, i have a tangible thing that they can put in their collection that's what's up as oreo would say sorry <laughs> <laughs> very cool what about you shate um so you can follow big car at big car picks and that's kind of our general work um our arts an artist focused work is tube art space on Instagram, let me double check that. Yeah, tube art space. <laughs> you don't want to follow me personally. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not true. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate all your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. And hopefully, I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.